morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of the uh, European University Institute and the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies to our DICE networking conference on Brexit this morning. Uh, DICE is a consortium of consortiums. Uh, we bring together in DICE the three large pan-European uh, research consortia on uh, differentiated integration. And I'm joined today by my co-scientific organizers, John Eric Fossum from Arena in Oslo and Nicoletta Perozzi from IAI in Roma. And we lead all those three very large uh, consortiums. And uh, we had wanted from the beginning to really, in a sense, then bring all of the knowledge that we will create within our own research projects uh, together. All of our projects look in one way or another at differentiated integration. And of course, Brexit is a very interesting topic and challenging topic in terms of differentiated integration. As we know, as a member state, the UK was the champion of opt-outs. It had more opt-outs than any other state, it was a large member state, and was not a member of very significant EU regimes, particularly the Euro area, but also Schengen and JHA. By deciding to opt for exit over voice, in other words, to leave the EU, the UK then became a third country and as such moved from internal differentiation to external differentiation. And uh, in our project, Individu, and my colleagues will also talk about how Brexit is treated in their projects. In our project, Brexit is, C, is looked at as a form of external differentiation because the EU has a variety of relationships with the neighborhood, with the different countries in the neighborhood. And if we remember that iconic uh, Barnier Escalier, there was a lot of debate as to where on that escalier Britain would end up. And as we know, it ended up going from the very top to not even being on the first step of the uh, first step of the stairs. In our project, Michael Keating leads a, uh, an in, uh, leads a work package that looks comparatively at the different relationships that the neighborhood has with the EU. In term, we look at the EA, Switzerland and Turkey. And of course, Brexit itself now is another model of engagement with the EU. We don't know how that model works yet. It's not working particularly well in its first months. Uh, and we don't know where it ends up. We don't know, will it be a pole of attraction for other states? Or is it simply a start and that the UK-EU relationship will strengthen over time and become more institutionalized again. So Brexit offers us a very significant scientific lens into that crossover from internal differentiation to external differentiation. I very much look forward to our engagement over the next two days. I think we have a lineup of terrific speakers uh, and I'm very, very pleased that Jean-Claude Pires agreed to uh, to open our conference with a keynote speaker. He's always been extraordinary, innovative uh, in terms of his approach to the study of the uh, of the EU and I look forward very much to that. Can I also take the opportunity to thank all of you for being here today, but also uh, Sarah Bernstein with, uh, and Martina Povova, without whom we simply could not have had uh, this event today. And to all the staff at the Schumann Center who have managed to take us from face to face to Zoom uh, in, we now hold up to 10, 11 events a week. And I'm always struck by how we've all adapted to our new world. But I must say, I look forward also very much to getting back to seeing you all in Schiffenoia and going down to Florence for a good meal in the evening. Uh, I look forward very much to that time, but given that that time is not with us yet, uh, this is the best and the very best we can do. And I now hand over to Nicoletta, who will talk to you about the IAI uh, program. Thank you. Thank you, Brigitte, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's really a pleasure and a honor for me to open this uh, DICE networking conference on uh, Brexit. And let me thank, first of all, UI for the great organization in these uh, difficult circumstances. 
Uh, as Biggie was saying, I'm the scientific coordinator of EUIDEA, uh, European Union Integration and Differentiation for Effectiveness and Accountability, which is one of the three sister projects that are involved in DICE. We have 16 partners, both think tanks and universities within and outside the European Union. And we try to look at differentiation, first of all, through a policy angle. We started with our project uh, um, with the um, recognition that differentiation has become the new normal uh, within the European Union, and also that the unprecedented challenges that we are facing during these years have reinforced this idea that differentiation can really be a way forward for the European Union. However, it is important to reflect on uh, um, whether, how much, and what form of differentiation is uh, not only compatible with the European Union project, but also conducive possibly to a more effective, cohesive, and democratic European Union. And that's why we try to address the key challenges connected to differentiation. Um, first of all, the compatibility with the principles of the European Union, but also the sustainability of differentiation in terms of governance, and its accountability vis-a-vis -vis the European Union citizens. Uh, UIDEA as well as a special focus on Brexit. Uh, this could not be uh, avoided, of course, uh, which is the best example of differentiation of our times. Uh, we have a specific Brexit observatory, which is led by the European Policy Center in Brussels, together with the Jacques Delors Institute in Paris, uh, Center for European Reform in uh, London, and CIDOB in Barcelona. And the aim of this uh, specific work is to monitor and assess the Brexit process and output, of course, but also to understand the impact of Brexit uh, in terms of differentiated cooperation with uh, EU countries uh, in uh, three main policy fields. First of all, economic cooperation, looking in particular at trade and uh, financial issues, security and defense, and finally, migration. So we try to understand what are the implications of Brexit in these sectors for the members of the European Union, but also to understand in terms of external differentiation, what this change in terms of uh, relationship between the European Union and other third countries. And finally, very important, we develop on this basis a series of scenarios that will then feed also in the work of DICE. And uh, we will be uh, looking in particular at future scenarios of differentiation in the uh, next year of our joint project. So with this, I would like to uh, end my opening. And once again, I thank Brigitte and John Eric for the great cooperation in this uh, common endeavor. Thank you so much. And John Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I would really like to echo the uh, nice words from my colleagues. It's a great pleasure to cooperate. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to engage with so many people today. Um, I'm coordinating EU3D. Uh, and doing that from Norway. Um, so that in itself is, is, of course, relevant in relation to Brexit, and I'll, I'll get back to that. EU3D, as the name implies, uh, differentiation, dominance, and democracy, is takes us this point of departure that differentiation is intrinsic to modern political systems, and that certain forms of differentiation are associated with dominance and vulnerability, and other forms are necessary prerequisites for democracy. And in that um, particular picture, we would like to, to uh, situate the EU as a distinctly differentiated system. So we are interested in developing a theory of to specify the conditions under which differentiation is conducive to democracy and those conditions that are conducive to dominance and vulnerability. So uh, unauthorized forms of, of, uh, of uh, integration and interaction basically is, is associated with dominance, both actually intentional, but no less importantly, unintentional and structural factors. So they, these are, that, that's the kind of the theoretical framework. We have a diagnostic aim to try to get a sense of the patterns of, of domination in the EU. We have 
uh, looking, we're looking at countervailing democratizing forces and dynamics. We are assessing different types of scenarios for the future of Europe. And part of that, of course, intrinsic to this is both the internal and the external aspect of of the EU's uh, of the and of course being located the coordinate coordinate being located in Norway which is closely affiliated but not a member of the EU in, in itself provides us I think with a useful vantage point also for assessing Brexit because if you look at this from Norway it's actually a triangular dynamic on the one hand the the uh, bilateral Norway UK relationship and on the other hand the Norway EU relationship which is deeply institutionalized and then the dynamics between the UK UK, Norway, and, and the EU. So that in itself is a very complicated uh, uh, picture, but it's also a very useful vantage point to get a sense of the different aspects of this. So we are, we, uh, we are providing an overall survey of the EU's different uh, external relations. And intrinsic to that, of course, comes Brexit. And we are very interested also in, in looking at to what extent the EA countries have lessons for the UK. And we're not now not only talking about mode of affiliation, the, the debate about the Norway model, but we are very interested in the politics of sustaining and opposing these types of affiliations. What make uh, a country like Norway um, support an arrangement which is a voluntary form of self self submission under hegemony, and yet the arrangement we have is quite well supported in the population. What are the dynamics that sustain this? Um, and, um, and, what, and, and the type of uh, quite dynamic form of adaptation we have. And to what extent will this be similar in the UK? And to what extent will there be significant differences? Um, and will the UK end up in a similar situation to these countries, despite the fact that it is, for instance, more powerful and so forth? So there are a number of very important and interesting questions to be studied in this kind of circumstance. Um, and I think we will particularly benefit from the interaction with the other projects and the large community of scholars in doing so, because what we see in, in today's dynamic world is that we can only gain and understand so much by working alone. And the more and the better co cooperation we have, the more, the more we gain. There is a win-win situation and, and circumstance in this. So DICE, in that sense, is a wonderful opportunity. And I, ha I now also have the pleasure of, in, of um, introducing our keynote speaker. And we are delighted to have Jean-Claude Perry as our keynote speaker today. He has a remarkable career behind him. He started with a law degree in Paris and then in a prestigious uh, ENA. And he immediately joined the Conseil d'État. And he was a diplomat with the French mission to the UN. He um, has been director of legal services in the OECD. He has been head of the legal service of the council and legal advisor to the European Council for 23 years. And he has since then been a very active commentator and everywhere on Brexit. And, and has written extensively. He has written a number of important uh, academic publications, in, um, including um, the Constitution for Europe, a legal analysis, the Lisbon Treaty, a legal and political analysis, and no less important in the DICE context, the future of Europe towards a two-speed EU question mark. So he is and he's, of course, also awarded uh, Officer of the Legion of Honor in France. So he's eminently qualified to speak to the topic of, of today. Please, Jean-Claude, we're looking forward to hearing you. Excuse me, could I also say something? Okay. Okay. Uh, just sorry, I, I need to make a technical announcement. And that is, in we will have a Q&A session after Mr. Puri has given his uh, presentation. 
um, but please send written questions in the in the Zoom chat function only. So I will read out the question to Mr. Perry once he has finished his presentation. Thank you. Sorry for the. Thank you so much, John Eric. First, I am delighted to be here, and I thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to express my views. And I hope I will give uh, ideas and food for thought to the conference speakers. Actually, uh, maybe you will be disappointed, but I will speak only briefly on Brexit, and I will speak longer on the future of the European Union and internal differentiation, and not about external differentiation today. So in the first of my five points, I will argue that after the referendum, the 2016 referendum, Brexit, and actually a hard one, could not be avoided. This is because the EU could not offer the UK enough further differentiation to satisfy its strong desire for sovereignty. But why did the UK withdraw after nearly half a century of membership? Some say that British political leaders were not able or not willing to convince their people of the benefits brought by the EU. Others talk about the effects of the British tabloids and of the many lies told during the referendum campaign. Some even think that the EU itself should have offered the UK a different kind of membership. But I really think sincerely that this was not doable. I think the major reasons for Brexit are the UK's geographical, historical and cultural singularities and the collective attachment of the British to their identity. They feel different and they also felt that their country was always isolated in the EU. You must say it's true that the EU did not always help. The British did not like it when the EU promised more than it could deliver. For example, with the Europe 2020 strategy, or 10 years before, with the Lisbon Declaration, or nearly 30 years ago with the two ambitious, ambitious aim of a common foreign and security policy in the Maastricht Treaty. Member states sometimes give ambitious aims to the EU, but without providing it with the necessary means. On this occasion, you have to admit that the UK was generally among the most serious and the most attentive members. However, I think it was less cautious when successive enlargements increased the EU membership from nine to 28 without the EU reforming itself enough. During the negotiations of Amsterdam and Nice, the UK was refusing serious reforms to adapt the institution's decision making. This was because it was deeply opposed to the EU becoming a political actor. It wanted to preserve as much as possible the sovereignty of the member states and thus as many vetoes in the treaties as possible. When it could not resist, because the political will was strong on the other side, and that was said this morning already, it requested opt-outs and it got so many of them, budgetary rebate, common currency, Schengen, social matters, justice and police cooperation, that it was nicknamed a half member. For the EU to go further than that, differentiation in order to better accommodate the UK was simply unacceptable for member states, for most member states, as it would have affected the heart and the soul of the EU, the freedom of movement of persons or the credibility of this single market. After the referendum, some people in London thought that the UK could keep a frictionless trade with the EU, a soft Brexit, without accepting the same rules as the EU and EEA members. That was, of course, a delusion. The credibility of the single market would be lost 
if all beneficiaries were not equally bound by the same rules. No soft Brexit was possible, given that the UK wanted to be free to adopt its, all its laws, free not to be submitted to any foreign court of justice, and free not to accept the freedom of movement of people. By saying that in a speech, Mrs. May, as soon as in January 2017, that is even before triggering Article 50, Mrs. May had rejected any agreement similar to the European Economic Area. The negotiations could not lead to anything else than a hard Brexit, that is the free trade agreement on goods with no single market. And moreover, given that the UK wanted to negotiate its own trade agreements, no custom union either. This is now done, and there is no likelihood of the UK rejoining the EU institutionally before long. I don't think that one should concentrate too much on finding a system of differentiation which might permit the UK a close and deep relationship with the reformed EU soon. I stress that today I'm speaking only about internal differentiation and not external. So I'm now coming to my second point. My second point is that with its current decision-making rules, the European Union is not able to face the essential tasks it ought to be able to accomplish. Contrary to some affirmations, my opinion is that it is today extremely difficult for the EU to reach decisions to fit the needs of 27 on many issues and policies. The number of cases where the decisions demand either unanimity, consensus, common agreement, common accord, comprise dozens of issues, a number of which are not vital for the member states. And getting unanimity with 27 different entities, it's simply mathematical, mathematically more difficult than with six, 12, or 15. The efficiency of the decision-making has consequently seriously diminished. Moreover, the EU enlargement might one day cover the six Balkan countries not yet members. The democratic and judicial structures of these states are weak and unstable. Their efforts to respect the rule of law is, for the time being, far from what they should be. If and when acceding, it's certain that they will add number, but also heterogeneity. And besides, we are in a period where the EU should exercise essential responsibilities. First, it must get its members to respect the rule of law, the EU treaties and EU law. Otherwise, simply said, it would have difficulties to survive. Second, reforming economic and monetary union. The recent recovery fund was qualified in an exaggerated way as a Hamiltonian turning point. It was a big step, but we are still far from what needs to be done. Would the EU be able to muddle through in case of a new crisis? Third, the EU must help its members. The fight against climate change, among other policies, will demand difficult economic and fiscal decisions in every member state, which means the need for more solidarity and financial solidarity within the EU. Fourth, solving the divergence over the migration policy. The 2015 crisis among member states will come back in the future. It's unavoidable given the demographic trends inside the EU and its neighborhood. Fifth, the EU should become a credible actor on the international political scene, and especially in its neighborhood. For the time being, more unity is badly needed in relations with Russians. But besides, 
what means one must remember the end of Yugoslavia in the 90s, I should say the bloody end of Yugoslavia, ex-Yugoslavia, and the total incapacity of the EU to react in its backyard. Would it be better today? I'm not sure. For all these fields, treaties generally require unanimity or common agreement to decide. Is the EU today able to fulfill these needs? Could it adapt its decisions to the heterogeneity of its members and their love for unanimity? For example, by using differentiation, going beyond Euro and Schengen on economic and monetary union, on tax matters, on migration, on defense matters. As you know, up to now, the 20 year old procedure, which allows enhanced cooperation on a case by case basis among some member states has been used only three or four times. The fear of being relegated to a second class Europe is still greater for some member states than the EU becoming less and less relevant. Thus, I think that before another enlargement, the treaties must be modified. Everybody knows how much most member states would like to avoid that. However, the EU shall be less and less relevant this is this thought done. So in my three last points, I will describe and discuss the feasibility of three options to do that. A first option is, and as John Eric reminded us, I have proposed that 10 or 11 years ago in my small book on the future of Europe, but I will not say the same today because the context has changed. So the first option is to transform the Euro area into an avant-garde of the EU, which the means, with the means to decide efficiently to progress quicker in order to adopt convergent policies. And you have people and you have member states in favor of this option now. Because despite the EU coordinating mechanism established through the years, the 19 Euro areas participants have kept the legal power to adopt their national budgetary tax economic policies. After the 2008-2010 financial crisis, the EU adopted many measures to better coordinate national fiscal and economic policy. And in 2020, given the COVID pandemic and the economic crisis, created the recovery fund, 750 billion euro, the largest program ever to be distributed to member states according to their needs to recover, either as grants or loans, or loans with money raised collectively on the markets. I think this will be insufficient if a major crisis happens. The need is to progress from coordination of policies to convergence of policies. But as you know, this is of course easier said than done because very sensitive political problems will need to be solved. And they will quote a few. First, the democratic problem of the Euro area. A transfer of powers from the member state level to the EU level would require, of course, a need for more democratic legitimacy at that level, coming from the European Parliament or more logically from the national parliaments. Difficult to say the least. Secondly, the risk of a division of the EU between two groups, the 19 Euro countries and the others. And even if the rights and interests of the other member states are protected, even with the protection of the Court of Justice and so on, this might not be sufficient to appease them. Third, the possibility of an opposition of Germany and the other frugal states. Fourth, the 19 Euro area members themselves might not be willing to establish together such an avant-garde. 
even limited to economic and monetary questions. And they would not, in any case, be able to be the basis for an avant-garde cooperating on many other issues. You have only to look at the great divergence in their policies on foreign matters, neutral, NATO, and tax policy, and so on. Thus, my conclusion on this first option today is that it looks politically utopian. So I believed it was possible. There was a momentum uh, 10 or 11 years ago. Today, I think for the time being, it's utopian. I come now to my second option. It's not mine, mine. It is the think tank Bruegel from Brussels, which proposed that idea in 2016. It is to establish a new basic core European Union for all member states with obligatory policies on the basis of the single market, custom union, trade policy, state aid and competition, etc., using the current treaties and institutions, but with four additional but optional clubs for the other policies. There will be four optional clubs, economic and monetary union, migration, asylum and Schengen, security and foreign policy, and the fourth one would be for other policies. These clubs would also use the EU institutions, but the composition of the parliament and of the council would vary depending on the participating states. Moreover, the clubs could use intergovernmental procedures and could have different decision-making processes, different executives, different lines of accountability. I must confess that I did not understand fully how the unity of the EU would be preserved how decisions made in one club and affecting issues managed in other clubs could be coordinated. And moreover, there are obvious links between foreign policy and all other policies. And finally, I don't see how the European project could be understood by the citizens and by third countries in the world. Which club would symbolize Europe and speak on this behalf? Would it be the basic one, the single market and the common trade policy? Sometimes. The foreign policy club? Sometimes, but with different countries. Same thing for the euro area. So I am afraid nobody would understand what is the EU. And thus, my conclusion is on this second option is that it looks impracticable. And now I come to the third and last option. And if you allow me, I would be longer on this. The third option has three aims. First, keeping the EU's unity, and if possible to strengthen it. Second, getting rid of a number of cases of vetoes. And third, having more possibilities of differentiation. First aim, to keep and strengthen the unity of the EU. Since 2008, you know that the EU has been struck by several crises due to significant difference of point of views among member states and sometimes between groups of member states. Some of these crises potentially risk regressing integration. Therefore, strengthening the EU's unity is essential. Some thought that Brexit would be a factor of division, but the EU remained united. The 27 remained united. There are other fields, though, where disagreements are much serious. I already mentioned them, in fact. It's the first division is within the euro area, and nobody knows what consequences an exit of Greece from the euro area and you know it was on the table a few years ago, would have had. And the divergence remained today between the frugal states and the others. A joint borrowing of member states on the market was accepted for the first time by Germany mainly, 
But all member states should be pushed now as a quid pro quo to achieve necessary structural reforms to strengthen solidarity between the 27. Second division is the rule of law, of course. Member states cannot have their own interpretation of the rule of law, like Hungary and Poland, but also others. The EU is based on the fundamental principle that member states respect the rule of law as described in the treaty. The legal link between getting financial benefits from the EU and respecting its values must be used and made to work. Third division, the migration policy. This problem is mostly opposing East and West. It will not disappear soon. It should be solved before and not waiting for the next crisis with new and wiser proposals than in the past, allowing solidarity of all member states participating in different ways, including by financial contributions. This is perfectly in line with the treaty. Fourth and last division, the foreign policy. All efforts made in treaty reforms for more than 25 years, I was there. The second pillar, the political committee, the high representative, the external action service, all of these did not give the desired results. One have to admit that there is no much progress. Look at the serious divisions on relations with Russia on positions on the Middle East. It is not good that the EU enlargement is the only efficient foreign policy tool in which effects vanish actually after accessions. However, in this domain on foreign policy and security defense policy, I think approximation of policies should come first before thinking about adopting decisions against the will of a member states. So to solve all these decisions with the exception of the last one of the foreign policy, I think that the reduction of the cases of unanimity or common agreement would help. And that's the second aim of this option, to amend the treaties to get rid of a number of cases of vetoes. This number, as required in the treaties, it's much bigger than people think. With the current number of members of the EU, it should be strictly reserved for vital decisions because its use is neither democratic nor efficient. It theoretically allows representatives of the tiny minority of EU citizens to prevent representatives of the huge majority of citizens to take decisions. Don't forget that there are 14 member states which have each less than 1% of the EU citizens. And even the two most populated ones have respectively less than 19% and 15%. According to the current treaties, some provisions directly or indirectly affecting the unity of the single market must be decided unanimously. Taxation, protection of the environment, energy, social protection, etc. This being said, I fully understand that the EU is still being formally an international organization. Each member state wishes to keep a right of veto on essential issue, issues. We can name uh, at least 20, the revision of the vital provisions of the treaties, common agreement of all member states, national ratifications. However, if on provision which are not vital, I think the treaty could permit a unanimous decisions without ratification for the less vital, passerelle, as in Lisbon. The accession of a new member state, of course, foreign and security policy, as I did, budgetary resources, the language of the institutions, the flexibility clause of Article 352, 352 yeah. and unanimity when the Council wants to change the Commission proposal without its agreement. That is a fundamental rule giving authority to the Commission 
in legislative procedures. However, one may think that uh, uh, this could lead to differentiation and as we'll say it in one minute. For other cases than those vital essential cases, I will dare to make two very bold suggestions. The first one would be to revise some treaty articles and to replace the right of veto of one member state by a kind of mini collective veto with a minimum of three to five member states representing at least five to 10% of the EU citizens. The second suggestion would be to confer a more direct powers on the institutions in economic and monetary matters concerning the euro area, and b, more precise obligations to member states about the respect of the rule of law, again on economic and monetary union for the euro area, and on immigration policy, and I would say including for passports. I know what would be the first reaction of the member states on these suggestions, of course. But the problem is that on top of these about 20 sensitive vital issues I referred to for which a veto might be justified, there are still dozens of other cases allowing the veto, which are certainly not all vital for member states, but do create cases of paralysis and the discussion should be serious about that. Thus, I suggest to examine the following four groups of treaty articles, which contained about two dozen cases of veto. The first group of articles would be the passerelle of the Lisbon Treaty. As you know, these cases were considered by the Lisbon IGC for a transfer from unanimity to qualified majority voting on which finally unanimity remained, but with the possibility for a unanimous decisions now to do it without ratification. Among these eight passfell in the Lisbon Treaty, five are interesting because they concern the protection of the environment and human wealth, social protection of workers, family law with cross-border implications, the multi-annual financial framework, given that the own resources system subject to veto limit the multi-annual framework, and an article about some modalities of enhanced cooperation. Second group of articles, those concerning directly or indirectly the single market and the level playing field for open and fair competition. Article 115 is particularly topical as it provides that I quote, issuing directives for the approximation of such laws, regulations, or administrative provisions of the member states that I insist directly affect the establishment or functioning of the internet market, end of quotation, require unanimity. There are two other examples where there is a necessity to legislate on social security and social protection in order to permit the free movement of persons and measures for family law with cross-border implications. The third group of uh, articles is about 15 cases allowing vetoes on decisions concerning administrative or institutional issues. As a result, they make it difficult to adapt the EU institutions and organs. They are slow to decide and may provide opportunities to blockages. Some concern the composition of institutions and organs, among them the Economic and Social Committee or the Committee of the Regions. Some concern the appointment of their members, for example, the appointment of judges of the Court of Justice and of the General Court by common agreement of all governments of member states. It is understandable for, for symbolic reasons because of their independence, judges should not be appointed by any EU institutions. Okay, but why is it not the case for other judges of the specialized courts? 
why the nominations of other independent institutions like the Open Commission, Court of Auditors, Executive Board of the European Central Bank are subject to different procedures which don't require the affirmative consent of all 27 member states. Fourth group of articles to finish, the articles which allow the European Council to intervene in legislative procedures. As you know, there is an article in the treaty saying that the European Council shall not exercise legislative functions. Despite that, there are in the other treaty, treaty on functioning of the European Union, provisions which provide such exercise, the so-called, in our jargon, breaking procedures, breaks procedures. Each of these procedures require, require only one member of the council to ask during an ordinary legislative procedure to transfer this procedure to the European Council. Then one member suspend the procedure, the draft legislative text will go to the European Council and it will not go back to the Council unless and only if a consensus emerges in the European Council. These matters are measures in the field of social security necessary to provide freedom of movement for workers and two cases regarding the area for freedom security and justice. And finally, in our area, which has already been subject for two EU harmonization measures, also in the freedom, security and justice area. I think it would be logical to eliminate the necessity of a consensus in the European Council in these cases. This is contrary to the philosophy to the European Union constitutional structure. I am now coming to the third and last aim of this last option. The reduction of cases of vetoes should be accompanied by more possibilities of differentiation. And I suggest here four ideas to be studied further. The first idea would be differentiation after the use of the constructive abstention, which exists now in foreign and security matters, and we will extend it to other matters. And when this constructive abstention is used, that means in cases of a possible veto, one member or several members of the council will abstain in the vote, but they decide to accept that the others will go ahead and then says they will not apply the decision. I would suggest an exhaustive study of all possible decisions which could permit that without, of course, endangering the single market, endangering the single market. One could look closer, for example, at some cases, some cases in the field of the area of freedom, security, and justice, some cases when the council must act unanimously when disagreeing with the commission, and some fields and cases dealing with tax, social, energy, environment policies, or other cases concerning directly or internal or in indirectly the internal market, always with the consent of the commission, because it is in order that the level playing field would be strictly respected. Second idea, differentiation after the use of a super qualified majority in the council. There is in Article 238, a possibility where the council does not act on a proposal from the commission or from the high representative. There is a qualified majority which still requires the, the 65% of the population, which, but which requires 72% of the members of the council instead of 15, that makes 20 members out of 27. One should study in an exhaustive manner for which unanimity cases this would be legally and politically conceivable to use such a super qualified majority. And then it will appear possible in certain case that this will directly open a possible differentiation. All the member states voting against the act would then voting in favor of the act would then be allowed on the case basis basis 
to continue and uh, enhance cooperation on this. Third idea, to encourage the use of the procedure of intergovernmental treaties between some member states on specific issues. This is actually another legal shape for enhanced cooperation. This has been used a number of cases and it's perfectly legally possible. Uh, it, they have to be compatible with the EU treaties, of course, but I can see this. Quote the Schengen Agreement before its incorporation in the EU treaties, the Prum Treaty in 2005, and in the years uh, 2010 and uh, later, the European Financial Stability Facility, the European Stability Mechanism, the Treaty on Stability Coordination Economic Governance, and the Single Resolution Fund for the Banking Union. Fourth and last idea, to encourage the Commission in its legislative proposals to be more flexible by allowing or even proposing temporary or even permanent opt-outs for two member states having difficulties. The Commission should take into account not the theoretical level of impact on the single market, but the actual level. For example, for smaller member states, as long as this would not significantly distort the necessary level playing field in the single market. This is an idea which I would certainly mention if I was talking about external differentiation as well. I am coming now to my conclusion. The option to keep the EU's unity and to diminish the number of cases of vetoes while encouraging different means of differentiation seems to me to be more realistic and less dangerous than dividing the EU in groups of member states. This would make the EU decision making quicker. At the same time, the number of cases of differentiation, enhanced cooperation, intergovernmental treaties, specific derogation, the possibility for some member states to go slower would be increased as long as the level playing field in the single market would be respected. I admit that all these suggestions appear to be legal and technical. The soon to come conference on the future of Europe, which will open on the 9th of May, should discuss important policies. I guess this means, would you like a European foreign policy, more democracy, more rights for the EU citizens, more protection and security, more poor environmental policy, more defense and so on and so forth. This is good. People, citizens should be given the opportunity to tell their opinion on what should the union deliver. There is of course no need for them to talk about technical and legal issues in the conference. Nevertheless, during an intergovernmental conference, which I hope will follow one day, one must talk and decide about these issues. Yes, it would be good for the EU to deliver, as I read every day in the press, on the respect of the rule of law, on climate change, on the protection of the environment, on energy, on public health, COVID, on the protection of the consumers and foreign policy, defense. The press is right about that. But the other question is, why is it so difficult for the EU to deliver? It is because the EU has no legal powers, no legal possibilities to act swiftly because it needs powers to act when the huge majority want to act. Often, one or two member states have the power to stop the EU. These issues are not legal niceties. They are at the heart of the future of the union. The union must have the necessary powers in order to be able to deliver. One has to avoid the risk that once again, the EU is given ambitious aims without the necessary means, including the legal means to act in an organization of 27 members. 
in terms of competences, in terms of the decision making, and in terms of a differentiation among its members. As my old friend Pierre Vimont, former Secretary General of the EEAS, wrote in 2018, I quote, the definition of a genuine migration policy, the consolidation of the Eurozone, the protection of the rule of law, or the conception of a new architecture for EU external partners, including post-Brexit UK, are challenges that call for an orderly vision of what a renewed Europe should look like. Flexibility can help smooth the way forward. It cannot replace a clear understanding among union members about their perspectives on the future Europe. But the merit of debating flexibilities could well be in the end to underline that the usual way of handling European affairs may have reached its limits and that a new process for defining and implementing genuine reforms is necessary." End of quotation. I do think that the day has come to recognize that such genuine reforms are necessary. And I thank you for the attention. Thank you very much. This was very stimulating and of course very timely in a, in a, in a sense, it is a prefatorial to the conference itself. You are sort of kick-starting the, the very debate <laughs> on the future. Of course, a debate that has been simmering, but of course, giving this a new impetus also very much under the heading of differentiation. We already have some questions and yeah. The questioners are relating both to um, Brexit issues, but also to EU internal issues. So I will start with a question from John Pete, who is an economist, a uh, journalist with The Economist. And he asks, I agree UK red lines made hard Brexit practically inevitable, as in the Barnier staircase. But was it inevitable that it be bad tempered on both sides? And he mentions vaccines, Northern Ireland, legal threats, Frost versus Sefcovic. Is continuing confrontation inevitable in your view? Should I answer immediately? Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks for the question, John. No, it's not inevitable. And I hope things go, will go better. And we should discuss with our friends in the UK how to go better because the UK is still uh, geographically close to our borders, uh, 30 kilometers. Uh, it is our biggest ally. It was a bigger trade partner and it will continue to be probably. But first of all, when we conclude treaty agreements, we sign it, we democratically ratify them, uh, the exit treaty and then the TCA, when they are democratically adopted, the UK must be uh, must apply them. Why the trust has deeply gone down? It's on the, if my memory is good, on the 9th of September, when the British government put on the table of the House of Commons the uh, the bill on internal market on British internal market, which was a blunt violation of the exit treaty. What Mr. Johnson, Mr. Frost, said the other day, and he did not say that uh, directly to the EU. He must he did it uh, publicly on the press. Is that they were obliged to violate the treaty, the protocol on Ireland again. So the first prerequisite is to try to discuss before doing something wrong. And uh, th these stories of uh, vaccination, of course, occupy the, the, the ground, but it will not be forever. We will discuss everything. That's the only manner to do it in 
this period. If the British government has decided to tell its public opinion that everything which happens wrongly in, in the UK is the fault of the EU, that is wrong to gain the trust. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. There's a further question by Sjors Peretz, and he asks, one model for allowing non-EU countries to participate in the single market is, of course, the EEA EFTA court model. Is there any reason in principle why that model could not be used to regulate the participation by Switzerland or the UK in certain aspects of the single market, but not others? Well, that's very difficult because for the EU, the EU is a political project. The single market is for freedoms. For the EU, the freedom of movement of persons is capital. We cannot have an union which is only economical, which is only for freedom of goods and not for freedom of persons. The European Parliament would never accept that, and I, I guess most EU countries as well. No, there, there is no problem for a similar agreement to the EEA to be thought of with Switzerland or with the UK. But first of all, these countries have to accept the, to have a kind of what they call, both of them, quote, foreign court, unquote. They accept that for the uh, United Nations uh, with the International Court of the Hague. They don't accept that here. You should know that all this, nearly 95% of the judgments of the Court of Justice of the EU are adopted by chambers of three <laughs> judges. So it doesn't matter if you have a judge or not. Uh, well, with the uh, EEA countries, but it has to be accepted as a whole. They accept the freedom of movement of persons. And this is a prerequisite. You cannot have uh, half of the single market, or it's another agreement. Thank you. Okay, there is a further question from Federico Fabrini. He says, that uh, Jean-Claude, I share the proposal to overcome unanimity, but how do you overcome the unanim unanimity of Article 48 TEU? What about the proposal for a political compact done as a new treaty outside the EU legal order? He, has, he, he refers to his own proposal in his report for the EPFCO Committee on the Conference on the Future of Europe. And there's a link also to that in the chat function. Please, Jean-Claude. Thank you very much, uh, Federico. Of course, I could not uh, uh, expect uh, uh, less uh, than you say. Of course, that's the weak point of my uh, uh, speech is that member states, I said it, member states do not like. They love unanimity. They don't like to be uh, deprived of a veto. But some of them realize that we are becoming less and less relevant. It's more and more difficult to take decisions. They keep saying that it's not the case, that it's the same as before. This is not true, simply not true. It is much more difficult. So if there is a possibility of keeping the unity of all member states and to admit that some of these decisions I have quoted are not vital for them, we should be able to have a super qualified majority, something like that, but not a veto of one member states, even to change the non-vital revisions of the treaties. I am afraid that Something as I proposed myself 10 or 11 years ago in my little book on the two speed, uh, I'm afraid that today it would appear as a very serious division 
between the East and the West. There was a momentum at that time, and even it has played a role in Brexit, I would say, because Mr. Cameron was, like me, like others, convinced that there was a momentum at this time that the euro area will come together and do something uh, uh, together, which uh, uh, will mean that the non-euro will be completely uh, left on the side and have uh, actually uh, no decision making in what happens to the EU. So there was a momentum at that time. Now the problem is that we are, after all this crisis I described, close to a division of the EU and we must avoid that and it will be refused by some Germany, Central Eastern countries, others that we divide according to these lines. Thank you. Okay, I have three more questions. Um, I continue to do one at a time for now. Um, but if, but I think we need to draw the line very soon. So it is from Paolo Tiocetti. What he asks, what's the incentive for member states to give up in advance their veto powers? Well, for member states who believe in the EU, they should realize that the EU is becoming less relevant. They should realize that the internal market is not finished and we are not able to finish it. They should be able that we are unable to decide on migration. They should realize that we are afraid of a new economic crisis which, with which we could not muddle through. We should be aware that the EU is, is not considered as a political actor in the world by uh, China or by uh, US except on trade policies. So they should be aware that if they believe in the EU, it's now or never. We have done the big enlargement of the 24 uh, enlargement. We did not make the reforms we promised to make in the Amsterdam and Nice Treaty. We are now thinking about a next enlargement to the Western Balkan countries, which we are not yet members, six of them. If we do that without changing the treaty rules, I am very sorry, but the EU will not be able to take decisions efficiently. It will be less and less relevant. Okay, there is a new question from Bruno De Witt. He asks, would the logic of your argument not imply that we should try to get rid of single country vetoes across the board in all cases, including for treaty revisions? Thank you, Bruno, for your question. Uh, I, I don't think so. I don't think so, because uh, uh, you can perfectly well in the treaties separate what I call the vital decisions to revise and the one which are not vital. I think they, I said there are 20 vital, uh, vital uh, decisions which should be left to unanimity. And I include in that all decisions on foreign and defense policies. But there are a lot, maybe they, they will say it, it's 30, it's not 20. Okay, we can discuss about other articles, but there are a lot of articles where it is not necessary for vital reasons to keep vetoes. And it's on these ones that I think effectively a veto, but one member state should bet should be forgotten. And let's have three, for five member states and 5% of the population or seven or eight or 10% of the population, I don't know, but something like that. Thank you very much. 
Okay, I have two more questions and I draw the line. So I will read both these questions for you uh, as the final two questions. So it's from Fabian. It is, and he asks, rather than further integration, how high is the risk of further disintegration? Could Brexit lead after all to a domino effect, not now, but when the immediate and obvious economic pain has passed and the UK starts to grow again? Despite everything, Johnson is winning politically, so might serve as an example to others. And then the last question is from Alexander Schillen. What would be your suggestion on how to reflect differentiation in processes of governance and decision making within the EU's institutional framework? I concur with you that establishing numerous formations of the EU Council and the EP appears to be rather impractical. However, what would you consider to be a good alternative, especially considering established principles of democratic legitimacy? Please. Well, I did not very much and very well understand the second question, but I will answer to the first question of Fabian. I don't think UK uh, will be an example. First of all, we see already uh, that uh, what said the experts uh, years ago, even before uh, the referendum, but certainly before the, the TCA agreement, uh, what would be the consequences of Brexit for the British economy. And these effects are wrong. Uh, of course, uh, I did not think that the UK uh, would uh, disappear and its uh, economic uh, growth will completely disappear or its rate disappear. It will not, but it will be, it will lose 4% uh, of this wealth uh, during the, the years to come, it's certain. Uh, but look at the Eurobarometer things and the attachment of the citizens to the European Union has increased since the UK left. So I don't think there is, a, which country is attracted now by raising, triggering Article 50 of the Union, when the biggest of the possible ones has so much difficulties and uh, had uh, uh, agreements which are, uh, frankly speaking, not very much in this favor, because when you are discussing trade and other economic matters be between a, a strong actor and a minor uh, actor, like the UK is comparing to the EU, uh, it's inevitable that unavoidable that the, the EU is uh, having uh, uh, won the, 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 the match. Uh, and the second question, uh, I did not understand the, uh, the question very well. Should I, I really read? Do you want me to repeat it? I have time. I mean, it, you have, it is, yes, okay. I'll reread it for you. It is in the chat function, so it's, you could also see it. Um, it says, what would be your suggestion on how to reflect differentiation in processes of governance and decision-making within the EU's institutional framework? I concur with you that establishing numerous formations of the EU Council and the EP appears to be rather impractical. However, what would you consider to be a good alternative, especially considering established principles of democratic legitimacy? Thank you very much. Well, I think it's absolutely necessary for the Euro area, and it's already in the treaty that uh, uh, in the council, only the members of the EU area are participating to the vote. It's inscribed in a treaty that for case, to case by case uh, enhanced cooperation, it's written that only the members of the council representing the countries participating in enhanced cooperation have the right to vote. Up to now, the treaties have kept the parliament as a unity. And I think the principle sh should say that. There is only one exception. So in the council, it works. In the European parliament, it works. For the future, I think that if you transfer major powers 
from the state level to the European level on EMU, touching at uh, national tax policies, national budgetary policy, maybe other economic policies, maybe other social policies and so on and so forth, you need to have a surplus of democratic legitimacy and accountability at the EU level. And I personally think that given that all this belongs now to the national competences, it's not in the EU treaties, it belongs to the national parliaments, it does not belong to the European Parliament, we should have a representation of the national parliaments of the EU members participating to that, EMU plus plus, in order to have democratic legitimacy. So would it be only an organ representing national parliaments or it would be partly a new organ representing national parliaments, but also have representatives of the European parliament in it? Maybe the second one would be uh, more of a compromise between two views, but I think it could work like that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for your very stimulating talk. We will, this is a good backdrop also for the more specific focus on Brexit that proceeds in the next three panels. And the next panel will start at 11.30. Just stay online, but you can turn off your camera in the meantime. It is, it is the same um, Zoom address and password to continue, but you don't need to log out on this one just to uh, rejoin in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.